you know, you know, I mean, it's maybe a finer grain than the fathom one, but interestingly, is that it gives it structure. Uh, yeah, know. and and it does a really nice job of clumping up the conversation into themes yeah. and, yeah. and titling the themes, which is all <laughs> more than a high schooler could normally do. Yeah. So I'm I'm impressed as well. Yeah. This is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, November 23rd, 2023, which is Thanksgiving morning. And uh, a happy, th happy, turbulent Thanksgiving to you. You too. <laughs> yep. Todd. May you live an interesting Gary. life. Exactly. Todd, and how's it, how's it going far away? It's going great. Yay. Is that your local volcano? That's that's Background. about three hours away. Very cool. Well, we now have majority humans. That's good. We do. We do. We got Rick. I want to okay. share this this picture from the interfaith Thanksgiving. So these are all people standing on each other and the world. <laughs> One person lets go, everybody falls. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, this is uh, nice from, illustration. Yep, it's from a thirteen-year-old. John Kelly. I'll paste a few more links for your brain. <laughs> the theme today, as often is on Thanksgiving, is gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, we can start there. If we end up at some point talking about the open AI kerfluffle and what it means for the world, that would not be a terrible thing. Um, but uh, I'm interested in how we're approaching, huh, maybe maybe what does gratitude mean for us is an interesting place to start. Hmm. Anybody who'd like to jump in? John, Good please. Morning. Great Good to, morning. Great to be able to join you, uh, which I usually can't, as you know, because I'm usually uh, working with a client. And, of course, they're having Thanksgiving holidays. So so, so are you. So am I. Yeah. Yay. Right. yeah. So I, I did think about this a little bit. And um, the, the even having a conversation about gratitude is um you know considered morally good right and i i thought about that <laughs> i thought what's going on there you know and and it, i thought about it in the context of other conversations many of us have been having about different things inc including uh, the gift economy or or gift economy versus transactional and part of that if you explore that conversation a little bit um uh, you know, it turns out that in the gift economy, the gift economy is not purely non-transactional in that people do think about, well, wait a minute, what has so-and-so done for us? And, you know, we better not get too far out of proportion. You know, we want to appreciate what we get and what we give, but we're going to be aware of the proportion because if we're not, it's going to get out of balance. And, and what is it we're trying to balance? We're trying to balance the relationship. So that's the key to me. That's the key to the gift economy is that it puts the relationship above the at least the accuracy of the transactional value of transactions. It says, hey, look, look at the look at this for the longer term. And I think that's better. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think in general, we would do well to move from uh, the kind of instantaneous transactional accounting of late capitalism in the direction of gift economy. But I would say, let's not stop there. Let's let's keep exploring, at least philosophically, um, 
whether there's anything that's really post-transactional and what that would be like. So those are my opening Thanksgiving thoughts. Love that, John. That's a great, great starting point. Uh, Gil, jump in, and then I'd like to jump in as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John, for that. Um, my first thought, Jerry, is that is that gratitude is a choice. It's a decision. It's an assessment people make and choose, you know, select a mood of gratitude out of the many other possible moods in any moment. It's an interpretation of how we are encountering the world. Uh, so that's sort of the philosophical opening. Uh, John, I was going to disagree with you at first, then I found myself agreeing with you. Um, and But coming in from the other direction, uh, coming in from the direction of relationship. Um, and I think about in a family or you know, in, a, in a reasonably healthy family, it's not transactional. Um, it's it's the foundation is relationship and in, in the relationship there is sharing and it only becomes transactional when things get severely out of whack uh, um, there's a there's a large a, a, a very large fuzzily bounded set in which transaction doesn't show up and somewhere when things stray outside those boundaries then transaction does show up and i think the challenge is it's one thing to imagine that in a nuclear family it's another in an extended family or in a village it's quite another in a nation of millions of people or a planet of billions of people where the relationships are very different uh so i wonder about that uh, you know you know you you, you raise the speculation of how do we move from capitalism towards something gift-like and um um there's lots of layers to the question but one of them is scale uh and the last thing i'll say is i'm remembering one of the things that really um, struck me in the dawn of everything, which we've discussed over the years, is um, is when Kandyan Rock, the uh, American philosopher in dialogue with the with the European Jesuits who were coming here to Turtle Island, um, reports on I, I think he or, or one of his colleagues had traveled in Europe uh, and and came back and said we're just we're just absolutely dismayed. We do not understand that you have people lying in the street starving. What's what's wrong with you people here? You know, we take care of each other. We feed each other. If somebody's on hard times, we feed them. It's just like it's just a given. It's not. And my interpretation of that was that it was not transactional. It was just part of the fabric of life. What Doris Lessing called the substance of we feeling, which I think is part of the story here about gift economy. So thank you for the provocation, both of you. Um, that was a really lovely start. For, for the conversation, John. Um, so uh, I want to put a couple of thoughts in, in the conversation, some of which have been heard in OGM before, but um, one of them is that good gifts ought to circulate. And uh, if you look at uh, Lewis's book, The Gift, uh, and then before that, Marcel Mauss's book, The Gift, and a bunch of other stuff, uh, gift giving, gift exchange is uh, a lot of the basis of society in different ways. And when Native Americans gave, and you know, stereotypically gave uh, settlers something like a peace pipe, they kind of expected it back in a year or two, mm. along with the stories of what had happened while the peace pipe was making the rounds. Yeah. <clears throat> that was what they expected. Um, and instead, the the peace pipes went, were sent to Queen uh, Victoria Elizabeth or whatever, and wound up in a, in a museum or who knows what. And it was a one-way exchange. It was considered just sort of like, a, here, this is yours mm -hmm. now. Um, and it's ironic to me that Indian giver is considered a pejorative. It's a person who gives a gift and takes it back. It's a complete misunderstanding of the gift circle mm -hmm. um, where, where the gift is meant to circulate. And a, a bunch of years ago, I have a couple large antique French posters. And a couple of years ago, I put a note out on one of my lists to see if I could circulate that poster because I had no wall to put it on. And I was like, hey, this it'd be cool if this moved around and we could put a sheet of paper on the back of it so that people can write down their name and like the dates they had, they they sort of kept the painting and so forth. And there were no takers. I got nobody to, to, to pick up and go, oh, sure, let's do that. Um, second thing I want to say is if you have dinner with friends and you leave a $100 bill on the table on your way out, you've just broken a social contract that's a that's an insult there's a like our being together socially is really like key and important and we do that um a lot of uh, interesting ways and the word poverty is a new thing around 1650 unemployment is a new term around 1750 they both show up with the industrial commercial economy uh with the industrial revolution and the notion that um everything has a price is new also 
like like things things didn't all have a price. You you could stay alive without earning income uh, for a really long time. So all the things that we think of as necessities or commandments of modern life are actually really modern. They're actually very new. And as the dawn of everything, I think, tries really hard to point out, it is really hard for us to un unsee that. We can't unimagine modern living where everything has a price, and if you don't have enough money, you will starve and die. We can't, we can't unsee that thing. And yet, most of human civilization was not like that. <clears throat> and, and I find that fascinating and scary, because humans are so adaptable that we're like, yeah, no, no, this is the way. And there's also been a concerted effort to make sure that we demonize other ways of organizing society. There's, there's, there's been a really concerted effort to say, don't look at those anarchists. And, and years ago, I went and read some Murray Bookchin because I was like, I want to read a little bit of anarchists. These people must be terrible. <clears throat> and I start reading a book that's all about cooperation in nature. And the whole first half of the book is all about how coyotes and termites and you know all these social insects and everybody else is busy like cooperating. And the cooperation is actually the, the, the default setting <clears throat> and works really well uh, all over the place. So those are... Um, I think I had, uh, I think I had no no other thoughts. But I, I'm I'm also really interested in the term gift economy. I think it's a misnomer. I like I prefer gift exchange. Uh, and oh, and one last story. Uh, I read a sociology text long ago that in I forgot where this was, but I think this is maybe sort of common. In in <clears throat> in this culture, it was common if you entered a town, if you were new to a town, <laughs> that people would come over and bring you like bread and salt or something like that. Uh, or a gift, and you were expected to reciprocate, but you were not expected to reciprocate in equal kind. <clears throat> Meaning, if you gave, if you went and visited them and gave them exactly the same amount of, let's pretend it's bread and salt, it would be like you'd you'd evened out the the setting, and there was there was no relationship left between you. So you'd sort of said, ah, enough of you, but you would come back and give a little bit more or a little bit less mentally, and that meant you had this ongoing little bond between you. Um, uh, uh, of the gifts sort of flowing back and forth. And I thought that was really beautiful. Uh, Todd, then Rick. I was thinking about gratitude. And I'm going to posit that it's both a practice and an outcome. It's a practice meaning pragmatically those who orient towards feeling grateful, expressing gratitude, feel better about their life. And so by investing in gratitude, there's benefits of that. But I don't think that's complete. There's also gratitude as an outcome that if I am attuned to the flow of life, if I am living in accordance with who I am uh, treating all creatures with respect, uh, feeling the beauty of, of life itself, then I'm naturally grateful. And I don't have to try to be grateful. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that the practice of gratitude helps lead to the outcome of gratitude. Um, or, and at the same time, we can attune to the flow of life and experience gratitude and i'm trying both love that thanks son uh rick and take your time stepping in yeah um <clears throat> i i sent a, a a note of gratitude to a colleague of mine who i've known for 30 years and Last Thanksgiving, um, we were home alone because my family went off to their other families. So <laughs> uncharacteristically, we were home alone at Thanksgiving. And I didn't even, you know, you know, I just was in casual conversation. You know, I wasn't even. And he says, oh, why don't you come over for Thanksgiving? And I said, oh, that's nice. And it was a great Thanksgiving. I mean, it really was an amazing Thanksgiving. I mean, it was so memorable. And so I sent him and I thanked him and I said, send my regards to Brenda or Mira and whatever. Uh, and, he, and he sent something back. And uh, so that's, you know, the practice of gratitude. Uh, I mean, there's so much research on the power of gratitude on mental health. It's just astounding. Um, 
Anyway, so it so happened um, my colleague had written a blog post and commented on a blog post on gratitude who connected me to another colleague who, who'd written about gratitude and did a video on it. And then that took me to YouTube on gratitude, which is a three-hour video on the research of gratitude. So gratitude is something that's, uh, you know, a top of mind. Um, but interesting enough, I, um, I I wrote a blog post, and, and then I suddenly realized I should reframe this with a gratitude lens. Um, and then I came to the realize gratitude is, is about improving one's own mental health and helping others, but it's actually primarily beneficial to yourself. Um, but then I came up with the notion of equity practice, which is um, uses the Rondium rule, which is about being fair and kind to everything. And um, that is about improving the mental health of others. So I want to introduce the, the concept of uh, equity practice in terms of fairness, not in finance. And then lastly, I'll give a brief story. Um, this was... Ooh, about 25 years ago, I went to Korea with my adopted daughter, who was 11 at that time. And we had a host. And um, um, Hong Su, was, I got to know him. He spent a year with me when I was at the University of Rochester. We became good friends and we made connections. And so he was my host. And I knew about the custom there, about, um, you know, they pay for everything. If you're a host, you know, you go to a hotel, you have meals. It's the responsibility and that is the Korean tradition. And I was told, respect it. And of course, I did. Um, <clears throat> but it got to a point where my daughter would just point to something. And be, lo and before, before, you know, he would go into the shop and buy it for her. And I'm thinking, oh, to tell me, don't say you like anything. anymore, <laughs> Because anyway, it got to a point where I had this interesting conversation with him. And I said, I truly respect your Korean culture. I want to be clear. And I do not want to offend you, but I, I think you're spending too much money on me. And I said, if you would allow me, I would like to pay for this hotel bill. But if you want to, that's fine. And I said to him, I said, if you're a modern Korean, you'll accept it. If you're a traditional Korean, I will respect your customs. And he allowed me to pay for the hotel bill. Love that. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Doug. Oh, one, one other thing, very quickly. I want to put a plug in for, for Jerry, actually. I want to appreciate Jerry for initiating the Neo blogs, the Neo book, rather, and experimenting with Substack, which I'm doing. And I won't go into the details of it, but I just think there's huge potential there. And Doug, I do read your Substack and occasionally like it. So how can we connect with each other's Substacks, okay? <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Okay. Um, I looked up uh, thanks in the etymology dictionary and found that it's related at its root to the word think. Huh. So I thought, why that? And of course, it's the uh, thanks is to become aware uh, through a relationship with uh, something that you are thankful for. And which seems to me making it related to namaste, uh, let the God in me uh, greet the God in you, and so on. Uh, it's to be thoughtful. Another interesting word along that line is metanoite, what John the Baptist is saying when he goes around saying, wake up my beloved, uh, or just wake up in um, the original Aramaic, it meant uh, to uh, to become conscious, to become awake. Mm. So thankful, I mean, but by and large, is there anything I'm not thankful for? Uh, there's nothing you can't learn from. So that's where I am, thanks. Thanks, Doug. There's this whole notion of expanding your circle of gratitude. There's also a, a meditation, I'm forgetting what it's called, <clears throat> where you basically are grateful for yourself and then your family, and then you expand out until you encompass the universe, and then you work your way back. 
that's a well-known meditation. Um, and it seems like a lot of people alive right now are not grateful for anything. They're expecting everything to be dropped in their laps or they have no understanding for gratitude or they think the world is so fucked up that they're not going to try being grateful for anything. I don't have, there's a dozen reasons why that could be, but it seems like there's a whole lot of people who have no sense of gratitude. Um, and, I, and I wonder how that works in the world and what it does to us over time. Um, Eric, please go ahead. Thank you. So um, just picking up on what you said, those people who are do not have gratitude can we look at what brought them to that point and uh, what kind of childhood they grew up in? I think older people need to try and have a certain compassion, especially like kids growing up in COVID and lockdown and what does that impact on their lives? So um, I participated in an interfaith Thanksgiving service on Tuesday. I sang in the choir and I was showing this picture earlier um, of uh, all the people holding up and the earth has the two hands on the top and everyone's dependent on each other or the whole thing falls apart. Mm -hmm. I think that's very poignant these days. We're all the interdependent and that's a key. Um, but gratitude, it starts the moment you wake up. Um, wow, I have another day of life. Wow, I can get up, I can walk or whatever. <laughs> every little thing. And in the Jewish tradition, there are blessings for every little thing. Thanking God for everything I have, my body. My, and uh, But what this uh, service brought up is the problem of homelessness, the deficit of homelessness. And the book I started reading by Cory Doctorow called The Lost Cause, also addresses it. Um, but I think Corey is painting a picture of a possible future society that many of us can't envision yet. And uh, what has to change in attitudes before that society that that would support the young people of today and their children. So it's just something to digest and process and then see where that takes us. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Gil? Yeah. Um, thanks, Eric. In, in the Jewish tradition, um, the first words uh, that you utter in the morning are words of gratitude. Um, gratitude for your breath returning, you know, for waking and your breath returning to you. Um, and um, in the Orthodox Jewish tradition, uh, and, the, and the Jewish tradition is filled with blessings of everything, blessings before eating, blessings before washing hands, blessing after toileting, uh, blessings, 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 of which are basically gratitude affirmations. Um, and for the among the Orthodox, the tradition is to uh, is to say a hundred blessings a day, at least, uh, which means to find a hundred opportunities to be grateful every day. I was in a choir years ago, the teacher, uh, a ruby-throated human named Sipora Sloin, at the end of practice, uh, the, at the end of the choir practice, would share her practice with us, which was that she brought out a gorgeous um, uh, turned, polish, turned and polished wooden bowl filled with a hundred glass marbles, I guess we'd call them. Um, and um, her practice at the end of every day is to go through the entire bowl and transfer a marble from one bowl to another and be grateful for something. A hundred times at the end of every day. And we were kind of staggered. He said, I'll make it easy on you. There's 10 of us here. Let's pass the bowl around and each of you do one at a time and each of you will get a chance to do 10. And it was fascinating uh, to experience and observe that, you know, the first one was pretty easy and the second one was relatively easy. And then it kind of got hard for people. And people had to dig and reflect and reach for what they were grateful for that day. And gradually the muscle kind of got built. Um, and by the end, you know, by the time you got to eight or nine or 10, there were like 10 or 15 other things that you wanted to say. 
So back to, um, I think, Todd, what you were talking about before as uh, gratitude as a practice um, with outcomes. That was a great experience of that. So, um, you know, we can... We, we can we can adopt practices that affect our imaginations. Jerry, I was really struck by what you were saying before, that, in which I interpreted as our imaginations are trapped in a transactional world. You know, I remember the way that, you know, attributed to Zizek and Frankel and all sorts of other people of, you know, it's harder to imagine the end of, easier to imagine the end of the world than the, than the end of capitalism. Uh, and people forget that capitalism is about 500 years old. You know, humans are about what, you know, depending on what kind of counts you want to do, five or 25 or 50,000 years old. We haven't always lived in this. But now it seems to be all we can imagine. And the power of these stories or glimpses of other communities, other cultures, other times that have lived in other ways seems to me to be deeply, deeply important um, for the passage that we're going through in the next, you know, decades or century. Thanks, Gil. So, so I don't know if you can hear me, Mr. Stewart. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping in because um, <clears throat> I can't get the, the, get the control off. It says I'm driving. I'm on my iPhone on the treadmill <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the Napa Valley. <clears throat> it's one of my favorite places in the world. I lived in the late 80s. And we're going on a wine train for Thanksgiving lunch. Um, so I'm, I'm filled with gratitude. I'm, I'm, I'm healthy. I, I think I have a path forward right now in terms of treatment. Um, I'm, I'm feeling gratitude for the, for the friend that I was texting this morning some that I've been in touch with regularly, some I haven't been in touch with for a while. Um, and, and Rick, you, you actually stimulated a great story of remembering that has two parts. One, the culture of Japan is the same as <laughs> Korea. And in terms of, you know, when you're hosting, you're hosting. And I don't know, a number of years ago, I think it was when I was having a hip replacement, I had a Korean nurse and I was talking about having just recently visited Japan. And she said, oh, <laughs> the Japanese stole all our cultural traditions. <laughs> Everything they do, they stole from us, which I, I, I found you know, kind of rather humorous. But what happened in Japan was, my son-in-law had a Japanese mentor who was a multi-generation medical family. And they own mostly all the hospitals in Fukuoka province. And when Marty was alive, we visited and had a, a wonderful time. We traveled all over Japan, but we were hosted for three days. We went up in the medevac helicopter. We had traditional meal at a Japanese home. We went out to dinner. We were taken around for all the shrines. Uh, we made um, traditional mochi, uh, pounding rice batter in traditional cement um, containers. And we stayed at a, a lovely hotel for a couple of nights and I went to pay the bill and it was all taken care of. And I said to my son-in-law, I said, Bryce, you know, come on, this is way, way beyond. <clears throat> and he said, don't worry, it's your tradition and he'll get you back. <laughs> so about two years later, I get a call from Bryce, my son-in-law, and he said, uh, well, it's payment time. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, he said, yeah, Dr. Um, Kamachi, who I've been calling Dr. Hamachi, 
quit paying tuna. <laughs> and she goes, that was a little poor. So sushi or sashimi for He said, it's payback time. He said, the doctor is coming to San Francisco with his two granddaughters, uh, one of his sons, and his mistress. And oh, guess perfect. who the tour guide? They're, they're coming to look at Stanford and Cal. And guess who the tour guide is going to be of the day there? <laughs> <laughs> so Bryce hired a small van, and I was the tour guide for two days, taking them all around the Bay Area. So that's my 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 great Thanksgiving story, and thank you for <laughs> that uh, that that fond stimulation of the memory, Rick. I appreciate that. And I just I'm, I'm I I may run out of power uh, anytime. So uh, I wish all of you a wonderful Thanksgiving, and um, thank you for the stimulation that these calls. Absolutely. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you very much. Thanks also for stop so for sort of dropping into practical gratitude about things in your life, which I wanted to head us toward also. Uh, Rick, I think you had your hand up earlier and it may have gone down automatically. Yeah, that's fine. No, I just wanted to to pin pinpoint a point of this three hour thing that talked about uh, the science of gratitude. And it'll probably come no surprise to many of you that w when you practice it, it actually helps to downregulate your amygdala brain. And it actually enables the neocortical brain to work more effectively. You feel more freer, more creative and whatever. But, you know, Gil, even though you, you know, you, you know, talked about the, the practices of, of gratitude, I only wish it had a more enduring effect in terms of peacemaking. Um, and so to me, the gratitude practices are a requisite, but insufficient. And um, I, I've been, you know, it's funny because when I was, um, you know, responding to these people who are talking about gratitude, it's suddenly, well, what's equity practice? So I'm going to dive into that to see how well that concept has already been described. People, and I have a certain sense of it. Um, which comes from a position of gratitude, but it's different because it's really focusing on other rather than self. Rick, the practice thing is, I think it's, I'm, I'm glad you raised the point of, you know, wishing that were enough or that it would last, but, you know, Jerry and I go to the dojo and practice martial arts and we keep practicing, you know, and I paint, I paint my house and, you know, someday, a couple of decades later, I got to paint it again. I've got to change the roof. Um, you know, I, I just took a breath. That, that should that be enough? I'm going to take another one. Um, we're, you know, we're it, it's ongoing. If this is, you know, we're not we're not machines that we set and forget. And even those have entropy that they're living within. So this is ongoing. And back to I think maybe what Todd said earlier on. It's not that it's a practice to get somewhere. It's a it's a way to live. And maybe that's in well, actually, I, I think what you just said makes the point that I was saying, actually, it's prerequisite, but there are other practices that have to be integrated in it. So if we're going to practice peacemaking, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how can we do that more effectively? Um, and I don't think we're obviously not very good at it. So how can we get better at that? So I think there's a, you know... Uh, a sort of overlapping domains of practices that if we were to harness, that we might be able to overcome our social, our dysfunctional social tribalism. It's interesting because I'm, I'm curious how there can be so many religious traditions on the planet where things like gratitude run really deep um, and yet they seem to apply only to their own people. Hmm. And there's this desacralization of the other. Uh, there, uh, some religious traditions honor every speck of life on the planet. Uh, Jainism, Buddhism, uh, and others are, are kind of like that. Um, but in others, no. And uh, I'm just very curious that there seem to be contradictory commands inside of the traditions or something like that, where there's a noble, there's a noble practice married to 
a really limiting belief and a harmful belief to a lot of people. And I don't like that. That makes me really angry. And I think people are, uh, we are extremely malleable. We love story. We love narrative. We really obey culture. We will do what our neighbors say. And we will, in fact, be restricted from doing other kinds of things if our neighbors don't like it very often. It's the rare maverick that kind of makes a go of it and does something really different among their neighbors. Um, and I think uh, this is a piece of, of the conundrum we're facing right now worldwide. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm very grateful to be alive for the period of time I've been given on this planet. I am old enough to have used a manual typewriter. I had a little Olivetti letter of 32, <clears throat> a little reporter's typewriter, and I would take carbon paper and go into a forest run park in McLean, Virginia with my little Olivetti uh, typewriter. And I would write letters to friends and keep a carbon so I knew what I'd sent. That was the original CC for people who don't know where the C and the C come from. Um, and I learned how to run a key punch machine for a Fortran course at Irvine that I dropped, but but learned how to run the key, key punch. Thank God I didn't need to know Fortran. Uh, and now have a slab of unobtainium sitting next to me that, that, that will translate languages for free. I can set this thing on the table between me and a person from Afghanistan, China, uh, whatever, like, like, and, and they, we can understand each other. And th that's one of a whole bunch of brilliant features that it does. And my little lifespan encompasses that. And behind me in the next room is a box, my little time capsule box <clears throat> that has, for example, five different versions of the Palm Pilot and uh, an Apple Newton and uh, a whole bunch of, and two Sony Magic Links and uh, a Radio Shack Model 100, which was way ahead of its time. That was like a little reporter's computer with a six line LCD display um, that I wrote some papers on and stuff like, uh, and that's just the technology arc of my life. Um, and my life almost spans kind of spans women's rights. Weirdly. I don't go, I'm not, I'm not old enough to, to span women's suffrage in the U S or nation or worldwide, but certainly the pill is 1960, 61. I'm born just before that. Um, uh, all these other sorts of things have come out during mm. my lifetime which is just nutty to me, nutty to me. I, I never got a Sinclair Gill. I, that, I, I didn't go the Timex Sinclair out <clears throat> or an Osborne uh, or... Uh, hey, bro. Yeah, I had a CPM card for my Apple II so I could run CPM uh, briefly there, which was which was a, the operating system that should have won. DOS? What DOS? Should have been CPM. Uh, K-Pro, there you go. And and I also still I have two Macintosh classics out there in the in the giant case with a zipper around the top. Those things are are like incredibly heavy. I don't believe that I lug them back and forth from work to home every day, uh, twice a day. That's incredible. Anyway, um, so I'm grateful for the span, and extremely saddened by the direction I see everything going in right now, which I attribute a lot to humans' malleability and complacency and lack of sacralization of the other. We Instead, we demonize the other. Um, and it makes me really sad. So, uh, a few thoughts. Um, in, in some ways, it's, um, it's all about power and politics. Uh, about 20 years ago, I got into a cab in San Francisco going to the airport. There was a Lebanese cab driver, and I said, well, there ever be peace in the Middle East. And he said, yeah, when the politicians get out of the way. So I commend everybody to read Tom Friedman's latest column about his time on the ground. Uh, in Israel, and the stories that he came back about, that he came back with about Israelis and Arabs and Palestinians taking care of each other, and it provided a, a little bit of light forward um, for him. Um, the other thought is about um, <laughs> and Jerry appreciate what you said about technology. What an amazing gift. 
And in some ways, the whole AI conundrum slash brouhaha slash drama that's going on is it's kind of a mess when I mean, it's kind of like we have this great tool. Let's just figure out how to use it and figure out how to um, how to prevent the calamity that it might be flash back um, at the turn of the millennium. So um, thanks for listening, folks. Thank you, Stuart. And you're reminding me that we're at a moment, right this moment, and I think this last weekend's events were really strong evidence of it, that this these technologies, which have advanced so far, that they could solve a bunch of our problems or they could catalyze a, a, you know global crises, like gigantic global crises that a bunch of people are really worried about. And I think that a big piece of the fight at OpenAI was over governing this technology so that it doesn't perform the latter function and stays on track to do the former function. And I don't think that that's easy at all. I don't think that's easy at all. Um, um, it, it's not, it takes work. Yeah. <laughs> it, it takes it takes it takes it takes real work and as Schmachtenberg said you know no matter what we invent as a system there are always going to be some bad actors and we need to figure out what to um what to do with them it doesn't just take work oh, sorry rick I didn't see your hand no no go ahead go ahead go yeah um it it doesn't just take work it takes um commitments uh, and norms and structures um, and, you know, some sense of what the work is about or for. Um, one of the things that's been puzzling me about OpenAI, and I've been posting in the in the Google group about that, is, um, you know, OpenAI has got a very interesting corporate structure. And the question for me is, who is the board accountable to? You know, I mean, in a normal corporation, the board's accountable to shareholders, elected officials yeah. are accountable to the people who elect them. Uh, Not-for-profit organizations, the board is often accountable to uh, a mission, whatever that is, but also to itself. You know, board. Well, that, this was a nonprofit. It was exactly that. It's what's an it's a not-for-profit that has a for-profit subsidiary that Microsoft invested in. Da, 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 but there's a governing board of a not-for-profit. Who are they accountable to? But it's just what you just said. They're they're accountable to the mission statement of the nonprofit and to themselves. That's it. That's just like a just like other nonprofits. Which is which which is which is arguably fucked up. Why? Because um, there. How do you? Ha what if the board strays from the mission? They just did. If if it's an, if it's elected, <laughs> you can throw them out and in theory elect a new board. If it's a self perpetuating board of a not for profit and they stray from the mission, what do you do? It turns out as we discovered in the last couple of days, that this board is actually in a strange way accountable to the employees of the OpenAI for-profit subsidiary because those 700 people vetoed the board's decision. So well, in, in, well, part, in part because yeah. a whole bunch of employees broke away and formed a company okay. called Anthropic that probably is going to hew more closely to the original mission of OpenAI yeah. because they rejected the direction OpenAI was going in. And that... that was, and that no, meant that no. the people who felt strongly no, about that no, were no, no longer no. present for no. all the subsequent actions. So I want to suggest that we stop getting down into the weeds, because what I was going to say is it takes setting the right context and the right person and the right investigation to understand all the nuanced pieces and whether or not those traditional things that you guys are pointing at are really a useful way to think about and frame the dialogue. There are extraordinary peacemakers and peacekeepers in the world who are biting at the bit to help facilitate all of these dialogues. But the politicians, and there's, as you know, a lot of politics in this conversation always get in the way often for their own self-preservation. Stuart, what do you mean by politicians? Any operative 
that has power or control or sway over a group of people who will follow what they have to say. I mean, that's my off the cuff definition. So we're back, we're back to the Jerry's conversation about anarchism before. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know, whether or not it's in the political realm or the neighborhood realm realm or the religious realm or the nation state realm, you know, there's that group of people who are more concerned about their own self-preservation. Remember, I can, when the U.S. Congress was filled with states people, statesmen, um, and a few states women who would put their own concerns aside, their own party aside for wisdom. Well, they were politicians. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, but they answered to a bigger calling, a higher calling. Um, Scott Peck, in his you know magnum opus, The Road Less Traveled, articulated the premise that most people get wrong. And most people translate what he said, many are called, few are chosen. And the real words are, reading from the original text, Many are called to choose. You choose is answering to a higher calling. At some point in time, when I read that, I said, No wonder my life has been so difficult and at times fucked up because I made the choice and it just had a bunch of things fall into place. So I'm sorry to cut off that conversation, but I just thought I'm, we might take it to a little bit of a higher level. Um, thank you. And we were sinking we slowly into the quagmire of the, the open AI kerfluffle of the weekend, which we can, uh, I think, save for a future OGM call because it's super interesting and hot right now. Great. Yeah, I was I was learning. I was actually learning some of the nuance what, what you guys were articulating. But I just thought we might have a little bit different conversation on Thanksgiving. Exactly. And I think Rick has a suggestion for us. Yeah, it, it's something that just dawned on me as we're having this conversation. I've thought of it before, but I haven't actually done this. And I'll make a suggestion. If people want to play, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine too. But it's an inquiry practice. And the, one of the things that happen in groups, Zoom calls, is you're following the flow of the conversation. The chat can capture some off you know, information. But actually, every time I go to the practice that I go to every Zoom call is what question is not being asked and needs to be asked? as a discipline. And so as this conversation has gone on, I've composed one, but if people feel in the mood, one could just take one minute for people to think about what question about gratitude that has not been addressed that you would like to ask. And this to me creates more of a divergent framework and inclusion where everyone can participate if they want to. I've never done this before, and I just thought about it today, uh, I thought about it, but not actually offered it. So I just put that on the table to see if people want to. I've composed a question, which I'm willing to share. But in the spirit of equity, I think everyone, if they feel so inclined, could do the same. But if you want to go with the flow of the conversation, that's fine as well. I'd be happy to go along with that. Any objections? Anyone not want to do that? So, uh, Rick, do you want to type the question into the chat so that we can all stare at it? No, what I, I was going to suggest not to put my question. Everyone put, I mean, I can put my question in, but I actually I'm interested in the questions that people have. The way we frame questions say so much about ourselves as well as the inquiry you want to make. And even the first pass of a question is just the beginning of a journey because as you get into it, you'll change your question. I've done this sort of professional development before. And it's fascinating how people can start with initial question and as they reflect and come back to it. And it's a question that doesn't have a simple answer, obviously, it's a wicked problem. Where does the question land that you feel like would be beneficial to explore? You know, we could spend much more time than one minute on this, but at least go through the exercise. If people feel like, I mean, it takes time, you know, it takes time to actually, you know, you know but that's one of the practices that I do with all Zoom calls. I come away with a question where I feel like, that's what I want to continue my inquiry and community with others. Um, a couple of things. So Rick, where you're heading seems very close to Doug Carmichael's 
uh, me, uh, serious conversations protocol where he's asking people to focus on what is the thing that we should focus on? What is the most important thing we could focus on right now? Which is similar, but not the same as what you're saying. What I, what I meant by what question, I didn't mean for you to put your own question in the room, but I think that the question you asked earlier is what question is not being asked and needs to be asked, which then allows each of us to explore our own space. That's kind of what I meant to set this up. Is that okay? Oh, absolutely. Uh, that's, yeah, exactly. Okay, good. That, that, that's, that's all I was looking for. Um, so I'm going to suggest that we go quiet for a minute with uh, this question or whatever just came up for you in this last little bit. Let's not use the chat for a minute. Let's just be quiet for a bit. And then let's uh, step back in and we can use the chat and the, and the conversation to, uh, uh, to sort that out. But uh, I will uh, mind a minute's time. Hey, Ken, you're just landing as we're going into a minute of pondering a question I just put in the chat, which is what question is not being asked and needs to be asked. So we'll come back uh, out of silence with that. That would be my timer going off. Um, so, Gary, since I can't um, type, um, I just want to throw my question in. Please do. Uh, thank you. So one of the great, I have found, um, mediation techniques is like um, geometry, which I got through high school by starting with the proof and then working my way backwards. So a great mediation technique is, what is the vision that we could all agree upon um, that we'd like to see as a compelling question and then figure out, so what's the, what agreements can we make to get there from where we currently are? I know what my answer to the question is, but I'll, I'll leave that open. Thanks, Stuart. Um, and I'm thinking, let's get a bunch of questions in the room, and then we can go back and talk about them. So let's not discuss each one right now. Let's just either uh, put your question in the chat right now, or uh, step in, raise your hand, and tell us what your question is. Either way is fine. And so while people are typing in the chat, I will go to Rick. Yeah, I, I just put mine in. I've been I've been thinking about this, so that's my question there. And it cool. dovetails dovetails very nicely on what Stuart just talked about. Actually, what is the vision? So I'm going to read backwards. I'm going to read what okay. you put in the chat real quick, just so that okay. we have it in the okay. recording. How might we cultivate okay. the practices of equity governance based on the rhodium rule? Be fair and kind to all people, the planet, the environment, nature, biodiversity, animals, the soil, and plants. Equity governance is about co-creating fair rules, fair plays, fair games, fair opportunities, and fair rewards to benefit all on a healthy planet. Um, alas, this conflicts with what I saw when I Googled the rhodium rule, which I had never heard of before. And the rhodium rule that I found online is take care of yourself first. Hmm. There's many versions of it. So but there's another not, one that- It's, it's not gonna help you to cite a rule that has like 12 different versions, I'm afraid. Uh, well, I go, we, we, let's put that argument aside and let other people add it. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to point that out, that, that it's, not, it's not helping your argument. 
So we have be kind to termites, says Eric, because they're the ones who are going to win at the end. Uh, John Kelly has his hand up. Please jump in, John. Okay, I'm going to paraphrase the title of a book that my client is writing. He's a uh, emeritus professor of law. He's working on a book called There's No Such Thing as a Fair Lunch. And it's a discussion of discrimination. But right. I'm not going where he's going with that title. I, I'm thinking that the, 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 there's no such thing as a fair lunch as a provocation. It's a provocation to say there are limits to using fairness as the means of trying to um, manage or, or facilitate our engagements. And we need, we need a beyond fairness uh, motivation of some kind. And we met, several have been suggested already in this call. And you know, we, know, we can think about what those are. But I mean, in other words, don't get, don't get overly focused on fairness as, and, and having it prevent you from doing something that's, that's worthwhile and mutual, but doesn't meet a, a strict definition of fairness. Thanks, John. So uh, a meditation on how fairness or the, the the goal of equity and fairness might actually be a limiting factor in making things better. I'm paraphrasing that well. Yeah, sort of like the the good, the, the perfect is the enemy of the good kind of thing. Fairness would be great and does not does not stop if we can't get there. Cool. Well, if people, if people, <clears throat> excuse me, people live by the golden rule or whatever rare metal we want to name things with, um, if people, if people treat each other well, then fairness doesn't matter. Fairness just sort of shakes out the mix. If you do, if you do unto others. Right. Um, unfortunately, yeah, I, I was going to start riffing on that, but I'd rather hear what other questions we have in the room. Um, Ken, Todd, Julian, Judy. Why do we sometimes resist expressing gratitude publicly? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Others, jump on in. Doug C. Uh, you're muted. You're still muted, Doug. Now you're unmuted. There we go. Uh, shouldn't we be thankful for all the things that we're not thankful for? Oh, that's right. You did put that in the chat a little bit earlier. <laughs> Good one. Uh, thank you. And it, it's. I mean, the logic behind that is that uh, dialectics requires that there be an opposition in order to get anywhere. Even the burr in your pants is serving a purpose. Um, others? I'm sorry, I haven't, I haven't been able question. to formulate My it question. yet, but uh, based on, if you look at what Ken just put in the chat, I'm still trying to get, uh, actually what, what Ken said is where I am. And so I'm still trying to formulate the question without it just being more of the, the same old stuff. So. So this is a meta question designed to break the question. Interesting. I Be like thankful. I li and and <laughs> I'd like to I'd like to come back into that conversation. Judy, go ahead. Well, the question I put in, which I suspect would be different for our group than the general group of the world, is are questions a part of your regular reflection and practice on a daily basis? I have insatiable curiosity. So my whole day is filled with questions which I pursue as I can, <laughs> but they range from ridiculously simple to ridiculously complex. And I think that the curiosity that's intrinsic in questioning is something that we've lost culturally in many different areas and it's to our detriment. Um, can I point out, enhancing on that, what Judith just said, one of the things I noticed a long time ago is, is I think the U.S. Constitution is actually pretty well designed. But when I think back to the 18th century, people had time to think about stuff. So it took you two days to get from Philadelphia to New York, I believe, because you were on a horse, even longer if you were walking. 
And so that left plenty of time to think. Nowadays, you're stuck in traffic. You're rushing here and there. If you're a parent, you got to go pick up the kids from cheerleading, et cetera. There's no time to think unless you end up with these hasty uh, decisions, which are spurred by the media that loves to do clickbait and trying to push you into a frame of thinking. And it's uh, how can you possibly come up with a thoughtful approach to anything when you don't have the time to engage in thought? I, I, I have friends who listen to tons of podcasts while they're driving or doing other things. And uh, my interpret, I don't know if it's true. My interpretation is that they have no time to think by themselves. It's all input from something, uh, you know, it's so-called idle time filled with stuff. Exactly. Uh, yeah, Judy, I, 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 I live in questions too. I'm a curious guy. I don't always pursue questions. Sometimes I just like to have them just hang out with me and see what, see what develops. Um, I'm, I'm really struck by what seems to me to be the lack of curiosity. Um, particularly among younger people. I've been I've been in a bunch of, of sort of networking conversations, not networking conversations, or what do you what do you call this? You know, <clears throat> some younger professional wants to talk to me and, and try to get my perspective on stuff um, or look for common interests. And again and again I'm just struck that people have conversations and don't ask questions. It feels like they are incurious. Um, and it really uh, and and I don't know if other people have this experience. This, this is a sense I have of people significantly younger than me, and I'm baffled by it since curiosity and questioning is so much a part of who I am. Very different way of worrying the world. Do people have that experience? I think a lot of kids have been raised to be in curious, to study for the test, regurgitate what's there. Like the school system is designed to stamp out curiosity. And if you've got a high achieving family, your goal is to pass all these hurdles that are standardized mm -hmm. tests and to get into a great college. And if you're entrained to that voyage, uh, that voyage is going to damage your curiosity unless you're really, really strong. And I think only only the strong and, and or really uh, uh, the, the rejects out of the system are the ones who manage to, to protect their curiosity and keep it going and protect their sense of agency, for example. Anyway, um, we've got Rick and Julian with their hands up. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, I think whenever you pose a question before, there was a quick reaction to my question. Um, one rejected it, different or whatever. The thing is, you have to understand the meaning of the words and the questions before you start discussing them. Otherwise, you end up talking across purposes. So, you know, and immediately, uh, Jerry, you went into a sort of what I would could say debating mode, disputing. Oh, that's you can't use that, and then. John came in with his framework of thinking about fairness, and then Gil came in with his. And to me, that's where a lot of disagreements occur, because we're not, we're not even sure we understand the question the same way. So a fundamental principle of using questions of inquiry is you have to understand what the poser meant by the question, see where the disagreements or agreements are, and then discuss it. Otherwise, you end up in debating modes, which end up to be largely futile especially when you're dealing with complex problems. And on that note, Ken, put a bunch of questions in that need to be read out. Uh, yes, and I want to get, I want to, get uh, <laughs> get to Ken's questions, exactly. Um, and, and Rick, yes, and I think your use on, of the word equity, ever since I've met you, confuses me because I think equity is one of those squishy words that means different things to different people. And I think that the debate over just trying to narrow down how we mean equity and what you mean by equity and what I might mean and how there is a really long it's, conversation. Exactly. That's why it needs to be co-negotiated. As with fairness, it's co-constructed. It's not the imposition of me on you or whatever. And the problem in U.S. culture is it's got a fundamental bias against equality and equity, even though it professes to have one. Thanks. We're uh, much better at defining liberty and freedom, but we're not so good at defining what we mean by equality, what it really means, and what equity means. I will actually suggest that we're not that good at defining liberty and freedom, and that freedom has been co-opted like crazy by the far right, and no, no, I, I'm, I'm saying, against yeah, us. Yeah, I agree, but I'm, degrees, degrees, it's better than, and it's given a higher priority than. 
Um, Julian, and that's the reason why we need to go ahead. <laughs> uh, Julian, and then I'll ask Ken to talk through his uh, contributions to the conversation, if you would. So first, uh, Julian. All this talk about equity reminds me of the old parable about how do you fairly divide a cake when, when two anxious people are waiting to get their hands on it, right? You let one cut and the other one choose first. So. Which is the old conundrum of, among siblings, right? Yeah. One one cuts, one picks. Um, Ken, you put a, a bunch of thoughtful things. Uh, one of the things that, uh, one of my constant requests to Pete for the Plex is that there be permalinks to the individual posts in the Plex, because I see good stuff go through the Plex and I can't point to it in my brain, which is my own problem because of the quirky ways I use the brain, but I would love to be able to annotate. So Ken, I'm actually really happy you have a full LinkedIn post for the, the, where you took the, the I, I'm assuming mostly the same materials, I'm, I will go look. Uh, but I'm thrilled you did that because now I can actually kind of uh, curate it. And I would love for you to talk us through it a little bit if you'd like. Sure. So the LinkedIn post builds on what I wrote for Plex and talks a little bit more about mood management and assessments and how the assessments we make about the future then predispose us to towards certain actions away from others. And um, then I went on to talk about the news and, and how the news doesn't ask important questions. Um, and so these are the questions that when I find the news is eating my brain that I go to. Um, so what's important now? And uh, what information and knowledge might I be missing and how can I acquire it? Whose views might I be overlooking either consciously or unconsciously? What do I value differently the, than the people I disagree with? And can I understand why they value what they do before I go and judge them? This came out of reading um, Monica Guzman's book. I never thought of it that way. It's just a terrific book. I really recommend it. Um, how can I shift my perspective to see differently and hopefully more comprehensively? And how can I increase the well-being, intelligence, diversity, variety, connectedness, and coherence of the systems that I'm nested within? Um, thank you for, for that. I will go read the LinkedIn post. And I'd love to just sit with that as a group for a moment. If anybody wants to riff, add, question, uh, exercise this set of lovely questions. And Ken... I just wish everybody I bumped into and everybody I hear about were thinking in these ways. I just wish this was common practice. It would be lovely. You're, I think your suggestions are great. Thank you. Um, we can start the movement right here. We can all start to embrace these questions and just then put them out there. And, you know, it's like um, I, I, I've done the, the first move. Who's going to be the second follower and get this thing going for the people who are watching? You have to start doing a really crazy ass dance on the side of the hill first, though. There you go. <laughs> Um, go ahead. Again, I, I really, yeah, I really liked what you just said, actually. And um, I, I would say that all those questions could be applied to the question I posed and the initial reactions that I got to it. Actually, I feel like that this actually is a format for neobooks, that the way develop a process about how to create neobooks so that when we have our differences, which we inevitably do, we can see where we're, where we're this middle ground, where, where, where can we acknowledge the differences in a way that can be inclusive so that you actually address the questions you just said. So how do you create learning communities that do this so it can provide the governance, stewardship, and leadership so we're more effective in solving our wicked problems? Thank you. And, and I'm wondering, um, can this set of questions, do the, does it parallel a movement or a document or a statement you've seen out in the world? Or is this relatively a new configuration of these things? Like, I, I, th I know you're being inspired by a bunch of different works. Have you seen anything like this collection existing already? Mm. Some of it comes from um, my own thinking. Some of it comes from indigenous uh, teachers. Um, it's it's a lovely you know, synthesis of lots of really great thinking. Yeah. I, I mean, it's really hard at this point in my life, having been exposed to and uh, teachers and, and methodologies and traditions and what I've read. And, you know, I don't know where one thing starts and the other one, you know, leaves off. And it's like, this is just the latest iteration of what's going through my head these days of thinking of, I, I'm made a couple of decisions in my life here. Um, you know, one is I don't I want to amplify what's working in the world and not focus on what's not. I know there's plenty of shit that's not working. Nobody needs to tell anybody that. But um, in, your, in the post, I say, you know, with regard to moods, 
a mood of resourcefulness and fulfillment comes from doing an appreciative inquiry into what's working, what can be built upon, and what does effective risk management look like? Yeah, I know there's all kinds of things happening, I'm not ignoring them, but I'm not focused on, oh my God, it's going to paralyze me with fear. It's more like, okay, if this is happening, what precautions can we take? What what can we do to mitigate risk? And, and then what can we work with that's already working and build on so that um, things get better? And that's the stance I want to take for whatever remaining time I have in my life. I've tried troubleshooting for years and it doesn't work. And so I want to work with what's uh, what are the natural principles and, and processes that, that nature uses for collaboration and cooperation, collaboration, collaboration and cooperation, and at, to get systems to work. I believe I had a, a friend of mine that came to the Bay Area Soul one day and he said, what would you do if you knew the universe would back you up on anything you did? If you can learn how to work with the universe, the universe will back you up. So how do we learn to work with the universe is kind of where all these are, are pointing towards. I think that's the so, base all is the Society for Organizational Learning. Is that yes, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So I was just going to clear. I was just going to clarify the acronym. Yeah. Uh, Doug's got his hand up. So yeah. So if I could quickly, oh. and then I'm going to go ahead. Go, go ahead, Stuart. Um. So uh, small piece of self promotion. My um, neo book addresses uh, many of the current code problems in the world things that need exploration and addressing. And one of the elements of it, um, aside from some poetry to drive people into their bellies and feelings, and some of the facilitation techniques that I've used over time, is the notion that we need a some form of secular Ten Commandments for the year 2023 that looks to many of the things that we've been chatting about as guidelines, uh, as ways of being with each other. All the Ten Commandments of major religions, the US Constitution were written in an age so, so different than currently on planet Earth. And so, one of the things I'm excited about in terms of Neo Book is that, you know, this is just my musing, just like there were the musings of Muhammad or Buddha, you know, many eons ago. But now we get to use our technology to expand, elaborate, add. What a beautiful opportunity. Um, I agree. Uh, Doug, if you'll hold up one second. Um... I'm just going to put in, I'm going to screen share for a moment, the link I just shared in the chat. Uh, Christopher Hitchens is a, uh, I think, lovely philosopher. I'm sad he's passed. And he did a talk for Vanity Fair called his Ten Commandments, where he criticizes the Ten Commandments and then offers these Ten Commandments for the modern era. So somebody has been working on this, and I'm sure there are plenty of other variants. I will also add that the, the Ten Commandments out of said Bible are one of my uh, uh, pet peeves. In fact, I think they're terrible, just terrible. Um, anyway, do not condemn people on the basis of their ethnicity of color. Do not even think of using people as private property, et cetera, et cetera. I'll let you read them uh, yourselves. But I wanted to, uh, I like number eight, turn off that fucking cell phone. Um, but I, th I think there's a lot of wisdom in, uh, in his approach here. So I will stop share and go to Doug. Can I just make a quick quick comment to Stuart before he leaves, very quick before uh, he goes? Please. Just, Stuart, I love what you were just talking about, and I'd love to see it in the new books. I mean, we're all sort of doing something here. Imagine if you presented your article pre-publication on Substack, group of people came together, went through some of the processes we're doing here, enriched it, published it, and then come back again and keep iterating and getting people to react to it and creating a sort of mycelium network of people's post on neobooks, their own substack, and, and really try and create something that is uh, that goes beyond the individual author. It's really a collaborative process. And what Ken just said about he can't remember where he got this influence from other. I mean, that happens all the time. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Just get it out there. I agree, um, what... I agree completely, Rick. It's a conversation starter. And what Rick is saying is extremely neobooky. So thank you for that, Rick. I appreciate it. Um, Doug, you've been very patient. I'd love to get what you're thinking into the conversation. 
Well, I want to build on what Ken was saying about work with a positive. And I want to be critical of that a little bit. I mean, if you went to a doctor because you're sick, would you be comfortable if they only looked at what was working? They've got to look at what isn't working. And it's not either or, one or the other, it's both. And the interplay between the two, that's so important. And so much of the discussion here has been uh, my side is right and everybody else is uh, absent from the conversation. Just to, Thanks, to respond ahead, to that, Doug, I, I, I didn't advocate being Pollyanna and only looking at what's working. I said, do good risk assessment. Look at what is danger, what is what is causing harm, figure out how to mitigate and ameliorate that, but also focus on what can what can be built because that's where the immune system is going to be strongest. Yes, Jerry. And and I can I heard you say that you have made a personal choice to stop wasting your air, breath, life energy on the negative stuff and on what's broken. And I'm even maybe trying to explain what's broken to everybody. And I'm trying to raise and lift up and amplify the stuff that works. And, and I'm like, that's a great life choice. I, I, didn't, I didn't hear you saying we should avoid talking about the negative, all of us. I was like, I heard you say, this is a decision I've made for the rest of my life energy. And I'm, I'm, I can totally respect that. That sounds awesome. Um, other thoughts. We've got a lot of stuff on the table. Uh, I, and Ken, I, I wanted to say there there are a million manifestos in the world. They are a dime a dozen. I collect them. I've got a thought that I'll share in the in the chat called Manifesti. Uh, and I don't think this is a manifesto, but I would love if this were, and I, I, I really don't want it framed as Ten Commandments. I've got to talk to Gil about like how I got to straighten my head around the commandments. But but I'm really interested in giving this a title uh, so that there's a, like an irritant in the oyster that we might all be able to point to and rally around. And I think Gil might have a suggestion for that or something else. Maybe not, but you're muted. So you're going to have to unmute or we're never going to hear your, your pearls of wisdom. <laughs> Some pearls of silence. Uh, I just have it in my brain as Ken's questions. I, yeah, but we I, a tag tag to enumerated yeah. wisdom, which is the category I learned from you. Well, uh, no, if it were if it were enumerated wisdom, it would be Ken's ten questions or Ken's seven questions. Well, you can, um, you can, <laughs> but I have a but I have a parallel thought called non enumerated wisdom, which is in fact where it would go. Excellent. Well, I could I could toggle on numbers or not. So that's yeah. there's that. But to the question of sourcing, I mean, Ken, yes, of course, you were you were in every moment a synthesis of all you've ever been. But I'm calling these your questions. Which is a great starting point. And some of them you may have exactly quoted from somebody else, and some of them you've been influenced by other people, but it's a, it's a distinctively Ken Homer formulation, and I like it. So thank How you. How about Homeric wisdom? <laughs> oh, yeah. Homeric question. <laughs> Just be careful. You might go blind. <laughs> ah. <laughs> um, other thoughts, comments, uh, in particular on Ken's questions, but also about the whole conversation? For me, the, the the element of which, uh, you know, unfortunately, I, I'm like John. I can, I can't meet Thursdays, and I wish I could. Um, but what I've appreciated about the session is that there's been some healthy, generative dialogue with conflicts. I would love to gone into the conflicts and the differences, uh, and and having a forum where, you know, John and I could talk about and Gil and whoever else wants to disagree on the issue of fairness or equity, that you could do that. Because to me, it's to even those things are dynamic evolving. It's not a static process. And so we have to have some sort of um, sort of guardrails around what we mean by the term. So at least we know where we disagree generally and where we generally disagree on something. Thanks. I, I, I agree, Rick. Go ahead, Gil. <laughs> I disagree that we need to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I also, um, I, 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 to the debate between Doug and Ken, um, I have no difference there. Uh, diagnosis is critically important to understand the sy systems and dynamics and prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. And I'm with Ken. I found that, you know, to the extent that I have a theory of change, it's highlighting what's working. Um, because existence is proof of the possible. And I found that to be, you know, 
this is a game I played through my throughout my whole career is saying to people here here's the thing that's actually working that you like you can't tell me that it's impossible if I can show it to you on the ground um, and I've found that to be one of the most powerful ways of breaking people open when they feel stuck like there's nothing to be done here well here have a look earlier in the conversation Jerry when you were talking about Murray Bookchin um, there's a Rojava mini nation in in the Kurdish lands uh, in the Middle East very much inspired by Murray. Uh, and it's a it's an anarchist feminist sort of ecological community um, that's been devastated in the recent wars. But, um, you know, uh, when people say, oh, that can't possibly work, go take a look. Totally agree. And then the diagnostics become critically important to say, well, hmm, so like what's in the way here? Uh, you know, what are the things that, that 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 take us down the wrong path or paths we don't like? What can we learn from that? How can we think about where interventions might be appropriate but with a vision of something that's working to guide us? Um, uh, this is an aside, but I'm just planning ahead for OGM a little bit. Uh, April and I had an acquaintance who's in the water world um, who we had a really great conversation with last week. He is going to be in uh, Dubai for COP28. And has a uh, he sent us some materials about his uh, start his uh, nonprofit called Circle of Blue, and it was too many words, and he could really use some help synthesizing an elevator pitch or something really a simple way to explain what he's doing. So I kind of I volunteered OGM for it because the work he's doing is really OGM-y. Uh, Circle of Blue is all about shared data, open data, rethinking journalism, connecting up a bunch of stuff. It's extremely OGM-y. So I'm going to put an invite out on the OGM list describing uh, next week's call shortly so that we can think about it for a week and marshal resources and, and, and look at his materials because he sent a, a deck and a, a text description, both of which are just like TLDR. Yeah, yeah, will, ahead, he be, will, will he be on the call with us? Yes, he's actually going to be in Dubai and we'll call in. I, I, I locked down the time with him. Short aside here, may I? Yeah, please. Uh, when Hunter Levins and I were teaching the principles course for the Presidio uh, um, Sustainability MBA program some years ago, uh, one of the things that would happen toward the end of the semester was that student groups would present their pitches, their deck and their elevator pitch uh, for their project, for their for their you know sustainability entrepreneurship projects. Um, and um, we drove them really hard to elevator pitch. And it was amazing how difficult it was for motivated, passionate, well-intentioned people to get really crisp and sharp. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know, on the principle of you got 15 seconds to get somebody to say, I'd like to talk with you further. That's the only goal. Um, we had, um, uh, we surprised them. We had a klaxon horn under the under the desk the first oh, time. I didn't know this week. <laughs> we yeah, me, me and Hunter and 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 as soon as somebody said in their elevator pitch systems thinking, we would blast because <laughs> 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 that was being offered as like a proof of something. Like mm -mm, sorry, it was, it was it's, it's almost tautological. And it was a terrific <laughs> terrific discipline to just drill and drill and drill and try to get that thing down yeah. to essence and so i look forward to that thank you you're reminding me my first experience of something like that in the world was when i got out of grad school my first job my first sort of full-time job was at pricewaterhouse before it was pwc <laughs> in their newly minted strategic management consulting group which had been started because mckinsey did a study for pw and one of the results of the study was you need to get into our business so you can be a full service uh <laughs> full service firm and so I was one of 20 MBAs plucked from different business schools. Uh, they had uh, a couple of partners from the various big consultancies, uh, Bain, Mac, BCG, McKinsey. And then they didn't hire enough middle managers who knew what to do, which was one of the flaws of the program going forward. But we had a two week long training program in Keystone, Colorado. One of the things we got was Barbara Minto came in and taught us the pyramid principle in person. And that was like really awesome, which is a cool thing. And then the other exercise, one of the other exercises we did was to come up with an elevator pitch. And I never really thought about the concept before. And, and they were like, you know, the, 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 the partner, the managing partner of the whole firm is in the elevator with you. You have 10 floors to explain what the strategic man management consulting group does. And we came up with a really nice, elegant, like two sentence solution. I don't remember what it is now. It's not drilled in so deep that I can remember it right now, but it worked. It completely worked. And we had this like thing we could say to anybody and to, to explain our existence. 
um, the rest of it was, you know, an exercise left to the reader that didn't work so well over the next uh, over the next decade that this group lasted. But anyway, you're reminding me of that, uh, Rick. And then we're getting near the end of our call, and I have hopes that Mr. Homer has uh, perhaps a poem uh, in his back actually, pocket. I, actually, I would like to invite the people who haven't spoken to say if they have anything to to say about what they've heard so far. So, uh, particularly Judith, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. If you feel so inclined, if you don't, that's fine. But uh, you know, in the spirit of equity, I think it's important to allow people who have spoken less to say something at the end if they want to. Well, I can jump in real quickly. Uh, this is a very meaty subject for me. I was trained at the need to question because my mother's first response to any of my questions was, what do you think? Um, from the age of toddlerdom, um, so my daughter would say I have an insatiable quest in that regard. <laughs> um, and I spend a fair bit of my time trying to learn new things. But how to instill the quest for questions would be something worthy of further discussion because we seem to have a very unquestioning world around us that assumes that information that's garbage is not garbage and so forth. And so I'd enjoy a, a still deeper conversation around how to instill questioning or invite questioning or whatever that might be. I don't want to be too directive, but um, if I could, if, if, if you could write a little article on that and we could discuss it, because I'd love to hear, you know, what your mindset is behind it. So I don't know if you're interested in writing something and maybe for a neo book or something, but I, I just feel to do justice to it. If you give something in advance and you, you, you read it like what Ken has written and then you come prepared, then I think it's, you know, it's an inverted classroom technique, which I think can lead to a deeper conversation about the power of questioning. Okay. Uh, that's a, that's a fair suggestion to make <clears throat> and I'll try to do that. Um, and I do appreciate the work that Ken always puts into these things. So. Love that. Rick, you still have your hand up. Are you done? Are you? Okay. Um, so it, years ago, um, Peter Russell was actually my first coaching client when I when I got my certification. He's a very interesting guy. And and he'd call him up and he said, this is not an answering machine. It's a questioning machine. Who are you and what do you want? Which I thought was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, gets to the point. So this is not a poem. Um, this is, for those of you who lived in the Bay Area uh, at a certain time, this is John Carroll's annual Thanksgiving uh, column, which I, I really like. So Thanksgiving's always been my favorite holiday. It's comfortably free of the strident religious and or militaristic overtones that give other holidays their soft emanations of uneasiness. At Christmas, for instance, we're required to deal with the divinity of Christ. I know some of you folks have been up your minds about that one, but not me. On the 4th of July, we must wrestle with the question of whether all those simulated aerial bombardments represent the most useful form of nationalism available. At Thanksgiving, all we have to worry about is whether we can wholeheartedly support A, roasted turkey, B, friends, and C, gratitude. My opinions on these matters are unambiguous. I am in favor of them all. The Squanto gave corn stuff has been blessedly eliminated from the iconography, so the thrill of Thanksgiving is undiminished by caveats, codicils, or carps. That alone is something to be thankful for. Thanksgiving provides a formal context in which to consider the kindness of those that have enlightened our lives, the moments of grace that have gotten us through when all seemed lost. These are fine and sentimental subjects for contemplation. Let us start this year by, by being grateful for life itself. Think of respiration, where you take in oxygen, fortunately available in the air, and exhale carbon dioxide. And then plants feed on carbon dioxide, dioxide and spit out oxygen. Such a coincidence. Or the eerie beauty of the hand, the rare and remarkable ability to walk upright. Your eyes, your tongue, blessings on the component parts. Thank you, evolution. And I'm grateful for the teachers, the men and women who took time to fire a passion for the abstract, to give us each a visceral sense of the continuity of history and the adventure of the future. 
our society seems determined to denigrate its teachers at its peril and ours. This is their day as well. Even closer, companions. We all learned about good sex from somebody, and that person deserves a moment. Let's take a moment right now for that. Somebody taught us some hard lessons of life, told us something for our own good, and that willingness to risk conflict for friendship is worth a pause this day. And somebody sat with us through one long night and listened to our crazy talk and turned it towards sanity. That person is here in this moment too. And a moment for old friends now estranged, victims of the flux of alliances and changing perceptions. There was something there once, and that something is worth honoring as well. Our parents, of course, and our children, our grandparents and our grandchildren, we are caught in the dance of life with them. And however tedious that dance can sometimes seem, it is the music of our lives to deny it, to deny our heritage and our legacy. And thanks too for all the past Thanksgivings, for all the people we shared them with. <laughs> thanks for the time the turkey fell on the floor during the carving process, for the time Uncle Benny was persuaded to sing Peg of My Heart just one more time, for the time that two strangers fell in love and two lovers fell asleep in front of the fire, even before the pumpkin pie. And the final bead on the string is this very Thanksgiving, this particular Thursday, and the people with whom we'll be sharing it. Whoever they are and whatever the circumstances that have brought us together, we will be today celebrating with them the gift of life, the persistence of charity in a world that seems bent on ending one and denying the other. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. That's beautiful, Ken. Thank you for sharing that with us. I, I, I read it a very long time ago and completely forgotten about it. It's magical. Yeah, it's he's got another one too, which I couldn't find. It's it's an it's an older one. Um, but it talks about you know somebody taught us how to tie our shoes and how to use a spoon and you know these these things that we forget about um, that without which our lives would be pretty miserable. So and if and if you ever compare, don't know John Carroll. He is just a master essayist. I put a link to his site uh, in the chat. Just yeah, to, thank you. Been a treasure. And if anybody hasn't walked around comparing how people tie their shoelaces, you'll be surprised at how many variants there are. I just dropped the uh, the link in the chat there for everybody who wants to to see this. Good. I had uh, done the SFK. SF Chronicle is very mean about people who are not subscribers. Uh, so I I'm not a subscriber. I just found that on uh, just oh, typed good. in. Okay. I went to Google and said John Carroll Thanksgiving, and it popped up like that. Cool. I went to that and it was like unfriendly. So I, I found the one in my brain, which was sfgate.com. That works uh, well. Who who knows the vagaries of paywalls and not? Um, but I'm, I appreciate very much your reading that into the record here. Um, there is a there's a service now that does AI for Thank podcasts. I think it's called Deca or something like that. I'll uh, find a link, but uh, it occurs to me, we have a whole series of podcasts and it'd be really interesting to run a, a chat bot against them and see what we said, like train it up on, on the corpus of our conversations. <laughs> we've been, um, uh, 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 we've been training a chat bot on the corpus of the living between worlds conversations that Ken and I have been doing for the last four years. I, I mean, for the last four years, Ken, year and a half, right? You've been year on and a half, yeah. Um, and uh, next month, uh, which will be what, December 15th, third Wednesday in December, uh, we're going to preview the chat bot with the gathered multitudes of 30 or 40 people on a call and ask it questions together and see what it tells us. Pretty fascinating process. Awesome. And Eric's got the prompt all written up. Uh, Judy, you wanted to jump in? No, no, no. I was just congratulating him on what he's going to do with the next Wednesday call. <laughs> Excellent. Be, be there, folks. Cool. It was a really good call. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I am grateful. And enjoy your Thanksgiving. Um, I'm grateful to all of you and very super grateful to you for holding this space for however damn long you've been doing it. Thank you. All the way back to Yi Tan. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, was just, I, I, I remember Yi Tan. <laughs> Yeah, April and I were just reminiscing. I, I, at one point this morning, I was like, oh, and I've got the Yi Tan call this today. And then she's like, aha. <laughs> <laughs> So um, thank you very much. And uh, see you real day, soon. Everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care, Bye. everyone.